I'm Dan Mann, the District Attorney for uh, the 4th Judicial District, which is El Paso and Keller Counties, which I'll describe more fully as we go, go forward. I just actually hit this past summer my 40th high school reunion. Uh, I went to Billy Mitchell High School, so I'm a little bit familiar with flight, if you will, uh, but not really. <laughs> the, uh, uh, Billy Mitchell certainly has his history for you guys. The, uh, we had our 40th reunion, and I had a class of 850, which means you know, you know some of the people in the class, but not all. So I'm sitting at the reunion, and I'm at a table with a couple people I knew. Somebody knew a gal who was walking across who I didn't know. Her name was Jenny. I said, Jenny, come on over. I, he said, I didn't think you were going to make it. What are you doing these days? She said, well, I live in Kansas City. How come you came? She goes, well, because Colorado now allows to, that marijuana sales out here. And I'm thinking, oh, geez, here's about Colorado. She said, oh, yeah, I've outfitted the bottom of my car with this uh, uh, space to put a whole bunch of marijuana in. She started describing where she saw a state patrolman in Kansas, where she saw him in Colorado. She said she had a cooler that she bought. She was going to put steaks in it. And I finally turned to her and I said, so you think the drug dogs won't smell the marijuana because of the steaks? And she said, oh, no, no, that way when they hit that spot, I'll go, they're trying to eat my steaks. They're trying to eat my steaks. And then finally, she looks at me and she says, by the way, Dan, what do you do? <laughs> the guy next to me actually said, well, he's a local district attorney. You should have seen her face drop. <laughs> it was pretty funny, but it's kind of a reflection of where we are in Colorado today. She actually came up to me, you know, you do different events. The next event, I kind of wondered when she'd show up. Well, she not only showed up, she beelined to me and she said, Dan, you know, I've decided uh, I'm just not going to do that. It's the wrong thing. And I said, gee, Jenny, that's too bad because I've been on the phone with the Kansas authorities all day long <laughs> waiting for you to come back. But anyway, the, um, are you able to do cups at all? Yes, okay, we'll, we'll start with a little, little bit of fun. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun today. <coughs> While he's getting that tuned up, I'm, I'm here today with a couple of distinguished guests. Actually, one of the things, uh, when uh, Dr. Scott gave me a tour of the library, and he took me through, through some of your historical things, what I learned is that you guys are what people dream of. When you go back to Da Vinci, or even uh, before that, you have many writings and poems about people wanting to fly. So uh, actually, you guys get to live out dreams that people have had for years and years. I brought with me today Don Bates, who is a pilot. Has been, how long have you been a pilot for? 60 years. 60 years, and you're still flying today. What do you fly today? Carefully. <laughs> Carefully, there we go. Uh, Don actually uh, was here when hockey first started at the Air Force Academy, he helped get that started when it, when it was a club, and was one of their first referees for their games out here. I've also brought my dad today. Uh, some of you who may be historians, he joined the Army when he was 17 in the middle of World War II. Um, he, he joined the 30th Infantry and joined up with them in time, probably the fall of 44, I'm guessing. But okay. fall of 44, you certainly got to Europe. Yeah. So he was there at the Battle of the Bulge, for any of you who studied that at Malmody uh, with the 30th Infantry. So he's, he's here today to watch. That's not the right one, should be number one. <laughs> number one, there you go. Yep, that's it. Okay, who knows that song? Who can do it? Huh? Oh, right here? Are you getting volunteered? This is the first time I had someone volunteered. Okay, let's see, let's see it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Part of it, what I'll talk about today is, is no guts, no glory. Here's your glory. You get a district attorney coffee mug for giving it a shot. I think she did it the best of anybody I've seen so far, too. <laughs> that was pretty terrific. Come. <laughs> Do you need one of those? I have to admit, I don't run the jail. I can't. I can bind you maybe the next day, but I can't. Uh, that's about as far as I can take it. You can go ahead and turn that off. The, um, um, well, I'm going to start with, you heard the introduction, you've heard me talk briefly. What do you think the district attorney does? Uh, I'm not really sure. Actually, you guys didn't get the introduction, so you didn't even get that in. You're not sure. What do you think the district attorney does? Press charges on behalf of the state for various crimes. Presses charges, okay. What do you think the district attorney does? I agree with him. Oh, 
Or you got to expand a little bit. What does that mean? <laughs> Fight for the state in court. So I'm an advocate. What, do, what does the district attorney do? Um, it's also a slightly political role, so you have to make sure you're running on some of the foundations and promised voters as well. Okay, and my particular position is elected. Some states, uh, ours, we have 22 DAs elected locally. Other states don't necessarily have that system. They have an attorney general who's elected, and then he assigns people, which gives you a different philosophical case. Okay? So you see it as a political position. What, what do you, uh, so you think my philosophies in the Boulder DA might be different? Um, slightly. Slightly. <laughs> yeah, hold people accountable. Accountable? Yeah. What do you mean when you say accountable? Because that's not a bad description. That that's the one I use in high school classes, actually. Uh, I, I guess, yeah. Somebody did something wrong. Bring them to justice. Okay, I bring them to justice. Okay, now that's a new term. What do you think justice means? Um, justice means uh, doing the right thing, I guess. Okay. What do you think the DA does? Um, well, I watch a lot of law work. There you go. Uh, <laughs> I have to admit, I've maybe seen that once, but go ahead. Um, you know, it's kind of going alongside what they all said, like fighting for the state, um, assisting, I guess. And so I don't know if this is accurate or not, but like assisting police officers getting like, search warrants, that kind of thing. Okay. Now, you heard him use the word justice. So we're starting to talk a little bit about ethics when we start getting to there. What do you think of that? What do you think the ethics of the DA are? What is the ethical duty of a DA? The ethical duty? Yes. I would say to uphold the law and obviously support your counsel, which in this case is the 4th Judicial District. Okay, uphold the law. What does uphold the law do you mean? Uphold the law, well, obviously you're, there is a certain penal code that you have to follow as an attorney. Obviously, you're going to advocate for the side which uh, you take, which is the side of the state. What do you think? Uh, no clue. No <laughs> clue. Let me ask you to flip. They've described a little couple of people on the ethic. What do you think the ethical duty of a defense attorney is? Okay. Would that be different than my ethical duty? Because he's described it as, what was the second, the way you phrased it the second time? The second time, re well, representing your side of the penal code. Okay. The is that the same as the, am I the, am I the opposite side of the coin? Probably. Okay. What do you think? What do you think the ethics of the defense attorney are? To protect their client. Protect their client? Okay, and is that similar or different than the DA? Similar. Similar? And who's my client? Your client is sure. Now you were actually the volunteer, but I'm going to switch subjects on you a little bit. What do you think the judge is? What's there? What, how are they different than the other two I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay, done in a fair manner. What do you think? I think all three of them have the same overall ethical goal, which is to seek truth and to make sure that that truth is publicly upheld. So if the judge is going to hold the other two to that, the defense attorney is going to make sure it's there for his client and you're going to make sure it's there for the state. Okay, if I'm prosecuting you, do you want your attorney out for the truth? Yes. Because what if I'm the truth not guilty, what, so what if, the, what if the truth puts you in prison? I want everyone to be. <laughs> okay. Uh, for that do they truth. only represent innocent people? No. Of okay. Not. So, do you want your attorney out for the truth? If I'm innocent, yes, I do. And if I'm a taxpayer, I want the attorneys out for the truth, no matter what. If I did something wrong, then I deserve to be thrown in jail. What do you think of that? Um, I, I think the, uh, the defense attorney he's supposed to uh, get his clients out of this. Okay, and how's that different than me? Oh, because I think you're supposed to get him in the <laughs> trouble. Okay, so we're, we're the opposite side of the coin from one another. Anybody want to throw anything else in? Well, it's, like it's not just about seeking truth, but about mitigating certain situations uh, in order to judiciously man, uh, manage like taxpayer resources. So if you can plea bargain out of a certain situation to reduce charges and that sort of thing, uh, I would imagine you decide which and whether to drop charges as well. Okay, what are some of your core values? <clears throat> Your core values. What? Integrity. 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 What? Integrity, service, and excellence. 
service and excellence? And those are things you have to live up to? Can that be difficult to do? Is that something you're learning as you go along the way? Well, that's what, uh, why don't we go to my next slide? And next slide, we're going to skip that one because I'm a little bit late. We kind of beat that one to death. That is basically, if I look at any ethics book and they talk about the prosecutor, they usually have longer things, but that's the first sentence of almost every one of them. My job is to seek justice. And I have a great job, let me tell you. I am fortunate to have maybe the best job in the world. Because as I walk into my office each day, I get to seek justice. Who said that's doing the right thing? Somebody said that. Didn't they? Did you? Yeah. At the end, at the end. I walk in each day doing the right thing, and that's a wonderful thing to be in. It's actually a wonderful thing to be in a climate with other people who are committed to that responsibility. Sort of like you've got your core values, this is my core value as the DA. I represent, as I step into the courtroom, I say, I am here to represent the people of the state of Colorado. And I know most, actually, if you look at the history, if you're a history buff, if I go back to our constitutional founders, Victims actually went to a grand jury to get indictments and then hired prosecutors to advocate for them. So we were an advocate in the courtroom. And even today, some of these states have laws that you can go hire a prosecutor. Virginia, for instance, has that. Although less and less it's being done because it's seen as an ethical challenge to seeking justice because now you're advocating for a side. Most states don't allow that because I am considered not an advocate. I'm seeking justice. As I walk into the courtroom, I represent the victim. I actually represent the defendant. I represent the public at large, and I represent law enforcement. On any given case, somebody probably isn't happy with what I've done. Generally, it's the defendant. But sometimes I have victims who expect this, and we think justice is this. Sometimes I have police who think this, and we think justice is this. Quite frankly, from the public point of view, I'm the most scrutinized office in the entire community. Every single day, if you read the Gazette, you're going to see an article about my office in there. Somebody's been convicted. Somebody's been sentenced. Somebody hasn't been convicted. Somebody hasn't been sentenced. And so the public is going to weigh in on whether they think we are serving justice or not, which is sort of the community standard of does the community think I'm representing what they want. So that's my job. When I have young prosecutors, just like you're trying to learn your core values, I'm trying to teach them what justice is. Because as I step into the courtroom, quite frankly, we're the most powerful position in there. There's only one person in there who can bring charges, and that's the district attorney. That's a very powerful thing. You can ruin people's lives. You can ruin their reputations. They can lose their jobs just by charging them, much less if we're going to seek a life or death sentence, some very serious considerations. At the same time, as I walk into the courtroom, there's only one person in the courtroom who can dismiss the case for no reason. That's the DA. Defense attorney can't do that. Judge can't do that. That's a very powerful position. The, and trying to teach the responsibility of that through justice is one of the things we try to do. As I look at the defense attorney, quite frankly, he's the agent of his client. He is required to represent them zealously. The client says, take it to trial. That's what they have to do, whether they believe they're guilty or innocent. If the client says, get me a plea bargain, that's what they do. Now, quite frankly, most defendants don't really know what's going on in the system, and they're going to follow the advice of their attorney. But they're not a guardian ad litem. That's what we appoint for kids, for instance. They do what's in the best interest of the child. That's not what a defense attorney does. They represent their client zealously. So we are not necessarily the flip side of the coin. The judge, and this is where normally I say it, I have to tell you to tell, turn off the tape because I don't want the judges to know I said this. But to a certain extent, they're a glorified referee when I get in there. Uh, if I don't file a charge, they've got nothing to rule on. If I'm in the middle of a trial, if either I or the defense attorney don't say objection, they have nothing to rule on. Uh, so they are basically a referee in there. Now generally as we get to sentencing, they have more power and they have the discretion to decide what the sentence ought to be. But under the laws of Colorado, I actually in a lot of cases can file certain charges in my discretion if I want to that forces the judge to have to give a certain sentence. For instance, a couple of years ago, I personally did a couple of looter trials. If you were here for the Waldo Canyon fire, we had a couple of looters in the Rock Rimmon area stealing out of houses during that fire. I personally tried a couple of those. I filed what's called habitual criminal counts on both those people. I didn't have to, we chose to do it. The minute I did that, the minimum sentence the judge could give was 48 years in prison. And if the judge could not go below that, if he wanted to go higher, he had to do it in increments of 24. 
And actually on one of them, he gave 48 years. On the other, he gave 72 years. Had a huge deterrent effect, in my opinion. After those sentences, I noticed the Attorney General, John Southers, when they had to fire Fort Collins, was saying, if anybody's thinking about looting, did you notice what happened in Colorado Springs? They happened to get sentenced the month before we had the Black Forest fire. We had a lot of looting at the Waldo Canyon. I almost had none in Black Forest. And Black Forest was actually a bigger area to cover and actually had some much more valuable houses and things to steal in them. I think it had a huge deterrent effect at the same time. But that's some of the power and that's some of the sort of what the prosecutor carries with them. Part of what we're trying to teach my young deputies as they come in is how to not abuse that power. The, uh, because they should be as proud, they're the only ones in the courtroom who can say, I think that one guy's innocent and I'm dismissing the case. And they should be as proud of that as the one that they're saying, judge, I'm seeking a life sentence or I'm seeking the death penalty. And actually 20% of cases presented to us every day, we dismiss either because we think they didn't do it when the police present it or we don't think there's sufficient evidence. So that kind of gives you a background of my background. Actually, the other thing I'll kind of cover for my DA's office, um, we'll test you guys a little bit just so you understand who I am a little bit. Uh, Colorado Springs, uh, how long have you been, what year are you? Second year. Been here long enough to know Pueblo, Colorado? Anybody here been to Pueblo? Okay. Pueblo, Colorado. Uh, well, we'll pick on you. How about that? You raised your hand. I went to the mental hospital in Pueblo, Colorado. Okay. If you look at the population of Colorado Springs versus the population of Pueblo, which city is bigger? Well, I would say Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs. You're right. You got it. If I look at the city of Chicago or Colorado Springs, which city is bigger by population? Oh, Chicago, much bigger than we are, much bigger than we are. If I look at the city of St. Louis versus Colorado Springs, which one's bigger? St. Louis. Colorado Springs. If I look at the city of Pittsburgh versus Colorado Springs, which one's bigger? Colorado Springs. <laughs> if I look at the city of Tampa versus Colorado Springs, which one's bigger? St. Louis. Colorado Springs. <laughs> if I look at Salt Lake City versus Colorado Springs, which one's bigger? Colorado Springs. You got it, Colorado yeah. Springs. If I look at Honolulu, well, you can even in this, Honolulu versus Colorado Springs. <laughs> How about Miami? Miami versus Colorado Springs. Miami. Colorado Springs. Which is bigger, Colorado Springs or New Orleans? Or New Orleans? Yep. I want to say Colorado Springs. We are the 41st largest city in the country. There are 25, 26 states that don't have a single city the size of Colorado Springs. We are 10,000 behind Atlanta at the last census. And quite frankly, we're, we're growing faster than Atlanta is. I'm not sure if we've overtaken them or not. A lot of people don't realize how big they are. I have 79 attorneys in my office. We are the largest law firm in the Pikes Peak region. I cover El Paso and Teller County. Uh, my Colorado Springs Police Department, now some of those cities have bigger rural or bigger suburban areas, but quite frankly, when you watch Miami Vice, their jurisdiction ends at the Miami city limits. Just like my Colorado Springs Police Department ends at their city limits, but they actually have a, you, size wise, by square miles, you can drop four Miamis into Colorado Springs. You can drop four New Orleans or St. Louis into Colorado Springs. Population-wise, they're bigger than those. We have a very sophisticated police agency, and that's why a lot of my cases anymore you see, quite frankly, internationally. Yes? When is the grand jury going to Oh, that's a whole <laughs> other topic. We'll, we'll, we'll try to cover a little bit of grand jury as we go through this. Otherwise, save that question for the end uh, when we go through that. What I'm going to do is talk about uh, some of my career, some of the challenges I have faced from the beginning to end, how I've analyzed that now as a DA and things I've put in place when I came into the office and some of the conflict. And I'm gonna ask you guys as we go along a little bit of what do you think of that or how would you do it differently or those sorts of things. The, um, uh, and try to relate it back to some of the things you're doing. When I first came out of law school, I actually joined a small firm. The firm was around for about a year and then it disappeared. Quite frankly, the partners broke up. So I went over and applied to the DA's office and that's the first time you know, the elected DA talked to me about justice, which. I sort of knew or sort of didn't, sort of like you're sitting here today. I'm not sure you even gave me as much lecture as you just got in terms of doing justice. They told me that when I came in there that I would be sitting with a guy, I think it was a guy named Ken James. I'd be sitting in his court, I'd watch him do it the first week, second week he'd watch <coughs> me do it, and then I'm in the courtroom and it's my court. You start in misdemeanor court, which is misdemeanors in traffic, mainly domestic violence and drunk driving are the two main charges, some uh, cruelty to animal things and stuff like that. I get there the first day, and guess who's sick? The guy I'm supposed to sit with. So as I walk in, they said, Dan, here's your files. Sorry, we haven't got anybody else to sit with you. Good luck. And they walk me across the hall. Literally, across the hall to the courtroom. I walk in, and the courtroom is packed. 
If you're there in the 80s, there were only three major television stations. All three of the local affiliates are in the courtroom. We had two local papers, the Free Press and the Gazette. Both of them actually are in the hallway as I'm walking across. And I'm like, what's going on here? And I'm told we had a careless driving involving death that was on my docket that the community was interested in. What happened is a garbage truck driver had backed up his truck and run over somebody and killed them. OK, what do you think my knees are doing at this point? <laughs> what do you think you're going to face when you get out of here, when you get that first assignment? You're going to be in charge of some, some group of people or something, right? I'm walking in thinking, holy cow. <laughs> the public defender, Mike Warren, comes over to me, and he's representing the guy. And he says, Dan, you know, I, I really could use a couple more months to prepare for this case. Would you mind if I asked for a continuance? What are you going to say? Yes? yes? <laughs> what are you going to say? No. <laughs> You're a braver man than I am. You want to show a little guts and no glory, but I said, no, Mike, boy, I just don't know. I got witnesses here. I'm going to have to go talk to my supervisor. So I step out in the hall. What do you think I'm doing in the hall? I'm doing a happy dance. It's just, it's just, I wait the appropriate time, like went across, come back in. I said, well, Mike, uh, well, this one time. I can do it this one time, they said, but you know, uh, we're not going to be able to do another continuance. <laughs> and somehow I slid by under that. The, um, um, what do you think of the way I started that first day? Uh, I think it's pretty daunting Because you're going to be in a position sooner or later that you're stepping out into your first situation, but you're also someday going to be in a situation that you're going to have people coming to you for their first situation. And what is it that you want, how do you want to prepare them for them? As I went through the first, you know, I go into my first trial and I lost. I go to my second trial and I lost. And you are very isolated in the system we had to your courtroom. And pretty soon I'm starting to at least make some contacts with some peers, maybe a few months ahead of me in terms of what they're doing. And finally, you can start sharing ideas, and I start winning some trials, and I start winning some trials. Um, and uh, at one point, I got to a, a trial, it was a drunk driving trial. Cops at that time were starting a new program of having specialist DUI cops. Larry Fink was the cop I had in this case. So in the morning, you get your cases. I pick the jury in the morning. I do my opening statements. Uh, over after lunch, the officer takes a stand. I have him go through the drunk driving incident, uh, the roadsides, all that kind of stuff. We get to that one of those dramatic moments when you say, is the person who drove the car in that reckless manner here in the courtroom today? Well, Larry Fink, any, any of you been in a courtroom? A few of you have. You ever notice there's labels in there? In front of the defense, the defendant, it says defendant. <laughs> over on my side, it says prosecution. So it's kind of, it's kind of, you can kind of see, and Larry's been in there. He looks over at the defendant's table, and he doesn't pick anybody out. He looks through the courtroom. And he finally looks at me, he says, Mr. May, <coughs> uh, normally he'd say, Dan, but we're in the court. Mr. May, he says, I got to tell you, this case has been postponed for over a year. I've done 300 to 1,000 uh, cases between now and then. I can't recognize anybody in this courtroom. Now, what do you think my reaction is? <laughs> I'm sitting there going, because ah! what do you think just happened to my case? What's the judge going to do? <laughs> case dismissed. <coughs> Can't identify anybody in the courtroom. That was the end of my case. The, uh, I'll give you an opposite example. I haven't given the others. Later in my career, I was doing narcotics. And we had a young uh, cop just out of um, their rookie school. He was on the streets. He stopped somebody who had some cocaine. <coughs> and he decided I could just bust this person or I could try to take it to the next level up. So he interviews the guy trying to figure out where'd you get this. And the guy knew that they lived over by Memorial Hospital and he had a phone number but he couldn't give the address. Young cop being actually uh, uh, thinking through things decided to call him. He gets on the phone and he gets the person on the phone and he says, hi, I'm Domino's Pizza. You know, we're in your area and we've noticed our sales have fallen off around Memorial Hospital. And we think we have a really good product. Do you like Domino's? The guy answered whatever he answered. He said, well, listen, we know if people will try us again, they'll come back to us. Can I send you a coupon for a free pizza? The guy says, sure. What's your address? So now he gets the address of the guy. That's the type of person you want. Uh, they're, they're not just stopping with the single bus. They're trying to move it up the ladder. They're being imaginative. They're coming through with some new ways of doing it. The cop is worried that what he has done is illegal under the Constitution. So when he writes his search warrant affidavit, he says, I got the person's rap sheet, and on their rap sheet was their address. Doesn't put in the Domino's Pizza scenario, okay? 
When we get the rap sheet, guess what's not on the rap sheet? That address. So now what do we know? This cop's lying. So we go interview him. If you sign a, you actually swear to a search warrant, so what has he done? Perjury. So now I'm charging this cop with perjury. Do you think anybody's ever going to hire this cop again with a perjury conviction on their record? That's two examples. One cop who, quite frankly, didn't violate the Constitution. And if they did, that happens in their job. And we just have to explain to them where they overstepped their bounds. On the other side, I've got a cop who, in the courtroom, could have easily said it's the person behind that defendant sign over there and did not. Larry Fink, by the way, Judge Toss was the judge. Whenever he stepped into Judge Toss' courtroom after that, I could have 10 priests on this side testify one way and Larry Fink testify in the other. And guess who won every time? Larry Fink. And one of the things I found, just like you guys talk about your commanders or you talk about some of your professors, I found that judges do the same thing about actually prosecutors and cops. So when Larry Fink stepped into any room in that courthouse, what do you think happened? At the same time, I noticed there were certain cops that we knew pushed the envelope, if you will. And they would step into courtrooms and couldn't understand why judges were always relieved against them. You're going to find in your career you're going to be pushed with ethical dilemmas. Do I do the right thing? Do I admit to what I've done? Do I push this? In my case, or my cops and my prosecutor's case, there is no defendant that will ever be worth their reputation. You will be building your reputation every single day when you move ahead. I found that actually with my prosecutors, when they, we rotate them to different courtrooms, the staff of the new court will call the staff of the old court and want to know about that person. Do they come prepared? Do they know their cases? Are they filing frivolous motions? As you will go from job to job, your first day on, you are being measured. Did you come in here prepared? Do you know your situation? Are you able to respond to the things that whoever is in your command, or in my case, the judge, knows? And your reputation will go with you wherever you go. Um, so that's something that uh, I, I learned from that. As I was leaving county court, there's actually a charge in Colorado. It's illegal to let your pig run at large. <laughs> and there's actually a charge called pig at large. So I pick up this file and I'm like, really? I got a pig at large trial today? <laughs> Which is how it's titled on the file. Well, it was actually a cruelty to animals for pig at large. There was actually two counts. It was out by Callahan, Colorado. If you've been out there, it's kind of in the little bit of middle of nowhere. A lot of people out there have acreage. They like to have horses or animals or raise some crops. What happens is this pig escapes from the late next door, to, uh, from next door, comes over, and the lady comes out of her house, and it's eating her little garden right at the house. And if you're familiar with farmers, that's sort of a very personal garden. She was not happy. I met with her. She was an older woman, really nice person. And I uh, put her on the stand uh, as my main witness. At this point, I'm getting more comfortable in the courtroom. I'm watching the jury's reaction to her and thing. They, I, I can tell they just love her. She actually had the pig move in with them in their house. She had pictures of the pig in their house. Uh, she actually gave the pig a name. Anybody remember Green Acres? What was the pig's name? Arnold. Not real original back then, but she named him Arnold. So she had a name for the pig. She actually brought growth charts for the pig to show the jury. Uh, she had photographs of the pig at each age. I'm looking at the jury. They just love this lady. In law school, they teach you never ask a question you don't know the answer to. Never ask a question too far. Now, the first one's pretty easy. Don't ask a question. The second one, I'm like, what's a question too far? So we get to this point in the trial, and I have to ask that question I don't know the answer to. How is Arnold today? She said, we ate him. <laughs> the jury's interest in the case just went, no. Joyce trying to work for the Gazette is looking for an April 1st story to put on the front page. Her interest just went, no. <laughs> so the first time I was in the Gazette, and it was on the front page, or at least the front of the local, I think the headline was, we ate him. <laughs> and that's how I got in there. Well, I learned from that, uh, number one, um, uh, not to ask a question I don't know the answer to, and what a question too far is. It's a question I didn't need for my case. Did I need that for my case? I didn't need it at all. It was a question too far. Now, I will say you find over time, sometimes you're losing and you'll do anything to, you know, you, you can take chances in a case that I'm way behind on. I wasn't way behind in that case. I didn't need to take those risks. If I flash that forward and, um, well, let me ask you this. How do you think my boss reacted to that? Well, I'm on the front page, but they're not guilty. Probably, we ate him. Probably wasn't happy. Wasn't happy? What do you think? How's my boss reacting to that? 
okay, you're the boss. You got some, you're going to be in command of some people someday. What are you going to go down and say to that young deputy? Okay, what are you going to say? I mean, you kind of have to laugh it off. It definitely is a reach of like you said, to try to make you What do you think? I'd probably laugh. Okay, what do you think? Uh, I actually haven't asked you that one. What do you think? Okay, that's one of the things in my environment. I've, I've got my people, most of them are coming right out of law school. So I'm in a heavy teaching environment, if you will. Not dissimilar to what you have here. One of the things I found over time, whether it's me or actually I work a lot with the police agencies, young rookies on the street. I've got to have an environment where people feel they can make mistakes and learn from them. Because I learn from those mistakes. And sometimes some of your best learning lessons come from the things you did wrong. But if I go in and yell at that person, what's going to happen? Okay? Are they going to take the chances? Are they going to push the envelope? Are they going to try new things? Or should I not? When do you and what's the line on that? Well, as I flash forward, I was elected DA six years ago. I'm in my second term two years ago, Heidi Bauer. Uh, was in a trial, one of my top trial attorneys. She actually won the Trial Hound Award the year before. We give a stuffed dog out to whoever had the most trials. She's in a murder trial several weeks. She gets to the very last witness. And the last witness, she's putting in a videotape recording of the defendant's statement. In pretrial motions some weeks before, the judge had ordered us to take out certain statements the defendant said because they would be unduly prejudicial, so we took them out. In the middle of trial, the defense attorney raises, well, judge, there's some more statements I want taken out of that tape. Judge agreed, so ordered us to take those out. My IT person, rather than using the second tape that was made, uses the first tape that was made. So what's still in there when she sticks it into the machine in the courtroom? The first statements that should have been taken out. It gets played. Uh, the judge declares a mistrial, okay? Uh, the front page of the Gazette, mistrial, DA's d district attorney's mistake, and also spells out the cost it was to the taxpayers to do a multi-week trial. You're her boss. What are you going to do? What do you go say to her? Okay, you're going to go down and yell at her? Maybe not yell, just learning lesson. Okay, what are you going to say? You're going to be there someday. Somebody under you is going to screw up. It may not, may not be in the paper, but it may be something the colonel above you wants to know about, the general wants to know about, or uh, quite frankly, my military end up in the paper sometimes. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong, and sometimes it's a spin because that wants. Um, I was showing the paper. Someone read the article and then uh, talk about what, what she would have changed. How about yourself? Okay, oh, what are you going to do? I probably would like. Okay. What do you think? Uh, I, I think that's like a pretty egregious mistake, like to um, call this trial. Now, is that is that a time like double jeopardy? Like, would you not be able to? We retried it. Okay. Um, but at the same time, it was like multiple weeks already went into it. You have to get a whole other person like the juror. I don't know. I would just be, I would be pretty angry. Like, the attention to detail, regardless of whether or not like that was. Um, I'd probably yell at the IT person more so. I don't know what I did was right or wrong. Part of it drops back to, because I'm going to go through who I want to hire, who I want to bring in. When I hire people, I'm looking for people who are self-motivators. Because if they're not, I can give them all the training, education, experience in the world. If they're not self-motivated, it's wasted on them. I'm looking for people who want to be the best professional they can in whatever it is they're doing. And that they want to join my office because they know I'm going to try to make them the best professional and lead them to that opportunity to do that. Because that is the best motivator I can have. They want to be the best trial attorney they can. They want to have the best reputation in the courtroom. They want people to know they're prepared. I know that she was one of those people, and she's one of my high performers. I actually kind of remember even a quote one of my like from Teddy Roosevelt that says, the only people who don't make mistakes are the people who do nothing. My people in the courtroom, it's a dynamic situation. Mistakes are going to happen, and I know that. But I want them in the courtroom, and if I jump on them too much, 
what are they going to do? What's the reaction? Not only that person, but people throughout the office. What's going to happen on the next mistake somebody makes? How is Dan going to react? Uh, but part of it is, as self modifiers as I'm walking down the hall, she's on the front page of the paper. She knows the whole world's seen this. Who's going to be beating herself up more than her? There's nothing I'm going to say that will ever make it worse for her, if you will. And, and probably even today, she thinks back on, how could I have not looked at that IT team? Now, you mentioned the IT. That's actually an important point, too, because one of the things I teach my attorneys, this is your case. You're not going to blame a secretary for not filing a motion on time, or the IT for not knowing which tape to do, or the cop for not asking some questions you wanted. It's your case. You need to own it. You need to be responsible for it. And that is a big teaching lesson, quite frankly, for young attorneys, that it is their case. They need to take pride in that. Whatever you're going to be assigned to, this is your situation. And there isn't any other excuse, whether they're working on you or around you, it is your situation to deal with. The, uh, I was also reminded of uh, Marvin Lewis. Is that the coach at Cincinnati Bengals? So I think sometimes you borrow things from different places. He was out on a practice field, and the reporter was asking him, he said, I noticed the last receiver, you chewed them out when they dropped the ball, and you didn't chew out the previous one. How come? He said, you know, when I've got somebody going 100 miles an hour, working as hard as they can, dedicated to every practice, I don't have to say anything to them. If I've got someone who's dogging it out there, doesn't seem to really care, you bet you I'm all over them when that happens. I had an attorney that really cared, so I walked in, actually, whether it was right or wrong, and I said, are we ready for the next trial? You guys were doing God's work. Let's go do it again. Because they, my, both my attorneys, I have two attorneys on homicides, were feeling in the dumps and waiting for what's my reaction going to be. Actually, a few weeks later, they came to me and said, Dan, they've offered a plea bargain to me. We ought to take it. I said, you guys were doing justice to begin with. You were doing the right thing. We're just getting back in there. We're going to do this trial again because you need to put this guy away. Sure enough, they went to trial the second time. Guilty first degree murder. Put him away for a life sentence. So I felt that was my job, was to pick them up, because I knew how much she, if I picked the right person for that job, was hard on herself. Something for you to think about in terms of you're going to be in those positions in the future. As I moved into uh, district court, which is now you get the uh, rapes, robberies, murders, that kind of stuff, you also have secondary assignments in our office. You're assigned a courtroom and you get all the cases there, but then you have some secondary assignments. Uh, one of my first ones was vehicular homicide. I was in charge of our vehicular homicide prosecution. We actually have a team, and we actually go out to the scene. And i got to tell you, those are, in many ways, worse scenes than any homicide scene I've got into. Bodies aren't made to go across asphalt at 35, much less 80 miles an hour, if you will, or be in accidents. But that's what we go out to on the vehicular homicides, usually drunk drivers killing somebody. I have two teams, actually, in my office. The other is a homicide team. If you saw the OJ case, you saw Marsha Clark going into OJ's house with the cops. We do the same thing. We're there to advise them on Miranda issues, search, search warrant issues, those kind of things. I'm on that rotation, and mid-March I'll be, um, uh, it's my rotation in, uh, on the homicide team. But anyway, I'm on the vacant homicide, and we're out there, and it's a drunk driver's killed somebody. He's also injured himself very seriously. He's in the emergency room bed. The cop's looking at me, do I need to give Miranda? And for Miranda, one of the things that you have to be in place is if they're in custody, you have to give Miranda. If they're not, you don't necessarily have to give Miranda. Well, if they're in the hospital bed, technically we haven't arrested them, but they can't exactly get up and walk away from the cop. So it's one of those gray areas. Some judges will say custody, some not. So I said, let's be safe. Why don't you give Miranda? The cops have a card in their wallet, and they pull it out, and, and they read it off. Okay, anybody know what Miranda is? The right to remain you, silent. You have the right to remain silent. What's the next line, anybody? Anything you say can it be used against you. What else? You have a right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, point it for you. Uh, do you understand these rights as I've told them to you? And do you wish to talk to me not having those rights in mind? And that's what the cops kind of read off that thing, and it's pretty formal. Now, cops generally are worried. You know, they want to hear the person's story, and they're worried that'll cut them off, but they want to hear their story. And, well, this Jim Jarrell walks in, and he says, hey, do you like Clint Eastwood? And the guy goes, yeah, I love Clint Eastwood. He says, do you love those uh, Dirty Harry movies? Oh, yeah, I love those Dirty Harry movies. Anybody seen Dirty <coughs> Harry and that kind of stuff? OK. Uh, so some of you will relate to that. Some of you won't. And he says, well, do you remember that scene? They're talking about Dirty Harry. I'm kind of, OK. Do you remember that one scene? He shoots the guy, and he's dragging him down the hill. And he says, you have the right to remain silent. And then you say, can it will be a stance in a court of law? You have a right to an attorney. He goes to the rental. And says, oh, the guy says, oh, yeah, I remember that. Well, you knew you had those rights, didn't you? And he says, yeah, I knew I had those rights. So what happened tonight? You want to talk to me about that? Oh, he goes, oh, sure, let's talk. I'm sitting there going, 
okay, he told him the rights. The guy said he understood it, and now he wants to talk to the cop. We went in front of the judge, and the judge was kind of like the same thing. He said, okay, met Miranda to me, uh, and we were able to use his statement against him. What do you think of that? Creative. Creative. That's what I learned from that. Who said creative? Yeah. That's creative. The, um, um, you don't have to always be black and white on that piece of paper about how you read it to them. You can be creative in what you do. And actually, that is my industry anymore. My job isn't just to convict people and prosecute them and get the maximum sentence. I actually have more alternative courts, systems, and diversion programs than any DA in the state of Colorado. I'm the only DA who has a mediation team in my office because we have to do things more creative. We have to do things that are more cost effective. We have to do things that are more effective rather than just prosecution. And that's sort of what I carried from that. You're going to be faced with that same thing. Actually, one of the simple things I had when I first came into office six years ago, we didn't have Wi-Fi in the courthouse. You guys all have laptops? Yeah? What happens if you walk into a room without Wi-Fi? Well, Wi-Fi, uh, laptops are how we do business now. That's quite frankly how they're doing their plea bargain. That's where they're writing up their motions. That's where they're doing their briefs and sending them on. We walked into the courthouse, they had to turn them off. Couldn't do business. It took me actually two years to get us into the Wi-Fi age. You would think that wouldn't be all that creative anymore. But those are things you're going to be faced with in yours. How can I do it more effectively? Quite frankly, in mine, my budget is 10 point, uh, was, currently it's $11.5 million. You heard uh, my, my El Paso County actually has the largest populated county in the state of Colorado. I have more people in my county than Denver County, Rappaport County, Jefferson County. At the same time, I have more felony filings than any DA in the state of Colorado, the 22 DAs. My budget's 11.5 million. Denver DA's budget is over $20 million. The uh, Jefferson County DA is 19.5. Arapahoe, I think, is at 18.5. Adams, which quite frankly isn't even in our category, they're sort of the fifth largest, uh, is $17.5 million. I have to do things more efficiently. I have to do things. I mean, I'm in a fiscally conservative community. That's why a lot of people live in this community. And so we have to do things differently. Uh, and I'll kind of go through some of the things that we do differently as we go through. But that's what that kind of topic. Uh, when I was in, uh, uh, what's my time when we're done? about 30 minutes, so we end up right at 1.30. Okay, gotcha. And I gotta leave a question time in there too, right? The, uh, as I get into district court, um, one of the pieces of advice I'll have for you is sometimes you can look at the goals of where you wanna get and try to figure out how do I get there. I don't know what your goal might be, whether it's a higher rank or certain positions. I actually found that if you are in the moment doing the best you can or what you can in this situation, you will maybe have a greater impact on things than you ever did before. Sometimes when I look back at my county court, district court days, when I was just working my case, trying to do justice for this victim or for, against this defendant or for the public, I did some of my best work in terms of lasting effects. In district court, I actually had a number of, uh, I did quite a few sexual assault and uh, on children and sexual assault cases. I had a rape case, it was a date rape, and it was a gal who was working at a bank in town. She uh, uh, was very outgoing. Uh, she had very good scores for her employment. They loved her, the customers loved her. Uh, one of the cops there who worked off duty as a bank guard got to know her pretty well. Uh, she actually went out on a date with one of the bank clients. Um, uh, his name will come to me here in a second. But anyway, she, um, oh, uh, I don't know why my mind, mind's gone blank. But she goes out on a date with him. They end up back at her place and he rapes her in her own bed. Uh, a date rape. She comes to work the next day, she doesn't tell anybody. The cop actually over a couple weeks notices she's not talking to anybody, he's not talking to her, and he finally goes over and says, what's going on? And she won't really respond. About a month into it, he asks the same thing, she won't respond. He kind of keeps pushing her, and it's several months before she tells him what happened. In the meantime, what I, I got her employment records, she was a model employee, highest of things. A few months later, they're ready to fire her because of the way uh, she's not interacting with people, not doing her job. Her mom actually came to stay with her during that period. Notice now she had multiple locks on her door. Uh, she actually got a dog, which is not uncommon in those situations. Mom noticed she slept on the couch rather than the bed uh, where, where she was sexually assaulted. The, uh, we go to trial, and one of the first things the defense attorney says is in, is in his opening, you shouldn't believe her, this never occurred because if it had, she would have reported it the next day. The fact that she didn't report it tells you 
she made this up. Okay? At that time, uh, there was, I never heard the words rape trauma syndrome. Have anybody ever heard that? Rape trauma syndrome? It's a more common term today. It didn't exist then. I was talking with a psychologist at the police department, Pat Wyken. She said, Dan, I've been doing some studies on rape victims. And some of my studies show that actually what you've seen is the norm. Most date rapes, the number one thing is over half of them will never report it to anybody ever. If they do report it, they're going to report it late. It's the abnormal that reports it the next day. Well, I didn't know rape trauma syndrome. I didn't know that. And I thought, you know, this is a valuable piece of information. I think my jury ought to know and decide it was justice. So I went to the judge and said, I want to call Pat Wyken to the stand to explain uh, that the, the date rape is reported late. So at least I can turn to the jury and say, that's not an issue here. Set that aside. Let's look at the other evidence and decide if I prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. Judge kind of scratched it and said, well, I've never seen that before, but it sounds good to me. I'm going to allow it. So we put in her credentials. We put in some of her studies, and she testified to that. He actually allowed me to put in the locks on the door, some of that stuff, uh, although we, she wasn't able to testify necessarily about what that meant in her expert opinion. Uh, and the jury went back and later found out the initial vote was three guilty, nine not guilty. Um, the three convinced the nine, and they convicted Russell Hampton of uh, uh, rape beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, he actually went to prison in the 80s. He just got out a couple of years ago. The, uh, he's on parole, uh, maybe still on parole. The, uh, that went to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals looked at it and said, you can't do that. We don't allow stuff like that. I've never seen that before. And they dismissed my case. So they overturned the conviction based on the rape trauma syndrome that we brought in. Went up to the Supreme Court. I didn't realize. I was just a young, stupid deputy. I didn't know this was a novel issue. It'd never been addressed by the appellate courts in Colorado. Uh, they said, well, they, we've never seen this before. They actually had a second case up with mine. So there were two cases up there uh, that they were looking at. Again, I was just trying to do what I thought was justice on this case. The uh, Supreme Court actually split on it. The one side that didn't like what I did referred to her as Officer Wyka. She was actually a civilian employee. Police Officer Wyka did this, did this, you know, testified to this. The side that liked my side said psychologist Pat Wyka. So it was kind of interesting even how they kind of want to slant things. Was that the state Supreme Court? State, state Supreme Court. State Supreme, state Supreme Court. Court. On a split decision, my conviction got reinstated, and now rape trauma is admitted in the state of Colorado, along with the second case that went up uh, about the same time, slightly ahead of mine. But at the time I did it, none of those were on the books. So I had, I feel, through that case, kind of a lasting effect on the laws of Colorado. And I'm sure that case has been cited in other states where they wanted to start using rape trauma syndrome. I wasn't thinking about that. So I will say that sometimes if you're just doing the best you can on the situation in front of you, you'll find out in your career looking back you did some of your best work. The, um, uh, Check my time. Are you? Oh, if something broke down, so you're just putting it back together. I don't. I don't need to necessarily use a whole lot anyway. So you're okay there. Uh, in my job, uh, one of the things I try to do is things outside of my field. How else can I help in my community? At one point, I ran for election for the El Paso County Retirement Board. Uh, on that board, you have two appointed by the employer, one's the, the elected treasurer, and then two for the employees. And I got elected by the employees of El Paso County as one of the representatives. My first day on there, we found out that the guy running our pension fund was stealing from the pension fund. If any of you remember Mike Woody, uh, he was stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars. So needless to say, we fired him and he was being prosecuted. We had to hire somebody new. So we brought in some other people who ran pension plans from around the country. We did a search. We hit down to five people. We were bringing them in. As we brought them in, uh, the sheriff's office did background checks for us, rap sheets. Turned out one of the people had a misdemeanor shoplifting on their record back when they were like 18, 19, 20. And now they were like 45, 50 years old. The attorney for the pension plan looked at us on the board of directors, if you will, and said, if you hire this person knowing that, and if they steal from the fund, you as directors will be personally responsible. So he didn't got dropped from the list at that point. Uh, probably just doesn't even know why they were dropped from the list at that point made me think, sometimes those mistakes people make when they're 18, 19, 20, 25, 30 years later are still there with them. When we convict somebody of a shoplift, does that have a big impact? Some minor petty offense, can it have a huge impact on their life? And so that's one of the reasons I'll say that I believe in diversion programs, giving people a second chance, not necessarily putting it on. One of the things, when you applied here, 
Did you have to put whether you've ever been charged with an alcohol thing? The University of Colorado and CSU started that a few years ago. They used to not ask that, but you've had a lot of students on campus uh, that have had some drinking issues, and they wanted to know that because that's a problem for them, both publicity and liability-wise. So now they ask if you ever had a MIP, minor in possession of alcohol. So if I convict a kid of an MIP, they may not get into college, uh, which generally you would think being out at those parties around the campfire and people are drinking and the cops have to come in, is that a big situation or is it? It is amazing how things can stay in your record, but it kind of gave me a life lesson there. I ran for office in 2004. I've been in the DA's office here about 20 years and I lost. Uh, 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 I wasn't quite as welcome in the office after that. <laughs> so I, uh, I got hired by Carol Chambers, who was the DA up in Arapahoe and Douglas County, and she put me in charge of her county courts. Uh, one of the things I had to do is in county courts, you're getting those young people mainly out of law school. You have some experience, but it's usually the young people. I had to do all their evaluations, and her evaluation form was a one through four. Are we going to be able to pull that up or not? We will. We'll find out. It was a one through four on it, as a one not being so good, a four being tremendous. Then they had guidelines of how I'm supposed to score them out and look at things. Well, quite frankly, the form I had was the same one they were using on 10-year attorneys, 20-year attorneys. And I thought, is it fair for me to be measuring my people of a, uh, again, on a scale against a 10-year attorney when they've been here three months, six months, nine months? Usually they're there for about a year. And I thought, well, that's not really necessarily reflecting. I mean, they should always score below everybody else. But I should be scoring them for how they're doing in county court. So it made me start thinking about, what do I want for my people, one through four. How should I score them? But at the same time, how should I be bringing them along? They're gonna be with me for a year. What do I think they should be in three months, six months, 12 months? What should they be doing by the time they graduate my county courts, if you will? So it made me start thinking about it, because you're gonna get that. You're gonna have people that are gonna come into your command. Where do you wanna take them in that first year? Because it's a huge learning experience going up. Uh, I don't know if you're gonna be able to pull it if you have. I actually have my hand, handwritten stuff, but if you can't get it, it's not that big a deal. On the ones, I actually have nothing there. I thought if you're a one, you're in the wrong job. <laughs> if you're a two, then I start looking at, you kind of learn your basic trial stuff. You're starting to learn your evidence. You started to learn where to find stuff in your computer. You know, you know where your investigator is. If you're a two, you're starting to know your rules of evidence that you can cite to me. You started to do some imaginative stuff in court. You can tell me about a case that you did something special with the victim. If you're a four, you're tremendous. And I have three, what I expected, three months, six months, and then a four. I sat down with my people and I said, guys, in October, I'm going to be evaluating you. I want you to know what I'm measuring you against. You meet these things, these are the scores you're going to get. Because I think you need to tell people what you're going to do with them and set those expectations for them. The, uh, but it made me start thinking about what is my responsibility. Now that's technical stuff. But the harder stuff is, I want people to be ethical. I want them to serve justice. I want them to be a, have a work ethic. I want them to be responsible for their cases. I want them to have that personal responsibility. Those are harder things that you're trying to teach. I want them to be team, work as a team at the same time. Um, so I'm scoring them on that. We actually got to October. And I, I went to Carol Chambers. She was new. She didn't really know how budgets, I kind of knew how budgets were. I knew she'd have some extra money come the end of the year because you have to return. Can't, by law in Colorado, you can't spend your entire budget. It's a crime. So nobody does. She'd have some extra money. So I went to her and I said, I have some outstanding people, some fours, and I can tell you what they've done to make them outstanding. You have some money you give them for pay for performance. And she said, that's a great idea. I'll put it out to some other departments. I got more paper performance awards in my county court group than they got actually the rest of the office combined because I could really demonstrate how they were being outstanding. The, um, but it's something that you'll need to think about as you go forward. When I got elected, I came back, now 2008 hits, uh, my opponent who had beaten me four years before was running unopposed, had gone through the convention, looked like he was going to be the next DA. He had a little bit of a drinking issue. Uh, he was at a bar and drank a whole bunch of beer, if any of you remember that. And Channel 5 happened to be watching it with some cameras, I guess, undercover. And then saw him, and that was like, I think, at 4 in the afternoon. And then he goes out to the company car, gets in it, and drives to another bar and starts drinking there. And Channel 5 has got the whole thing. Uh, I did find there's a big difference between uh, throwing your hat in the ring and being pulled into the ring. <laughs> I had people calling me, Dan, would you please run for DA? We'd like to have another DA. I actually had to petition on. I had to get uh, a few thousand signatures, I think it was, 
and I only had 11 days to do it. Uh, there were a couple of congressmen at the same time in our area running it by petition. I think I got more petitions in 11 days than one of them got in three months, something like that. There was a real outcry by the public, and I got elected uh, in 2008. The, um, um, uh, I, the other thing I learned, it's a lot more fun to win than lose. But <laughs> the, uh, I get into office. One of the things I found out is that basically my predecessor had sort of checked out in May of that year when he got caught on TV. And so nobody was managing really the office for someone to make those final decisions. I had chiefs who had decisions that had to be make, made between their two groups that were arguing over how things ought to be accomplished. And sort of the stronger personalities would win out. And quite frankly, when you're in a leadership role, sometimes it doesn't matter what the answer is, you give an answer, and at least there's an answer there. And that wasn't happening in the office. So I had a lot of dysfunction. When I came in, I asked one of the chiefs, I wanted her to stay. She would not stay as a chief because she would not work with the other chiefs. Again. That's sort of what the situation was. As I came in in 2008, they actually were, if you remember, tax dollars fell across the country. Here in Colorado, they were cutting monies to the schools and everywhere else. I walk in and on my first day, the commissioner said, Dan, your budget's going from 10.5 to 9.5. You need to cut 10% of what you're doing over there. Which, by the way, uh, it's something like 90, Six ninety, I'll say ninety-six percent of my budget is personnel. Four percent is operating. Um, so it's a primarily a personnel issue. The other thing, of course, their pay is frozen. The next thing they announced is health care costs went up. So guess what's coming out of your paychecks, employees? Higher health care. So you're going to be going home. Not only are you freezing, and some of you may not be here. Those that will be here, your paychecks going to be less. I think I had some morale problems I was stepping into. As I looked at the previous year, their trial stats were, quite frankly, dismal. They weren't doing many felony trials. As I looked through some of the files, I found one gal, for instance, who was an example. She had two felony trials in two years. That's dismal for a prosecutor. You have to be doing at least six felony trials a year, because we have a lot of trial attorneys. That's what we're there for. That's what I'm trying to hire. When I looked into her background, I realized she had been in county court. She had done two drunk driving trials. Uh, and what happened is they had 10 attorneys leave the office in one month. So they just promoted everybody based on turnover. And she went up with others. And I had a number of them in there that, quite frankly, didn't feel confident, didn't feel confident, didn't feel like they knew what they were doing, were scared, and were giving plea bargains left and right. What's my ethic duty? Justice. Am I doing justice to the community when I got that situation? Can I look my neighbor or victim in the eye and say, you have a good prosecutor that's going to be doing the right thing in this case? Or are they going to be doing it out of fear of stepping into that courtroom? So I stepped back with my management team. And I said, well, let's start with, who do we want in here? Who do we want to hire? Because that's something you're going to have to start with. Who's on my team? And we actually sat down, because you want to work with the people, because they're the ones who are running it. I've got 79 attorneys, and I've got 25 to 40,000 cases every year. I don't prosecute uh, all those cases. So you've got to work with your people who are going to go along. Well, we sat down. We wanted, you've heard some of mine, professional, ethical, work ethic, team players. Um, Actually, I want them to come in with a sense of humor. My people go out to some of the worst scenes you've seen. Um, actually, one group went out the other day to a burning body. Uh, that's something you don't get out of your mind, what that smells like sometimes. The, uh, but when they come back, we want to have a, I want to have a team that we, we can get along with. One of the things I learned in an uh, interview course, they had an interview question that isn't supposed to be um, finding out from the person you're interviewing, but it's supposed to tell them, this is a fun place to work. You ask the question, which is, have you ever had a prank pulled on? And uh, uh, that's supposed to sound, and you say, well, you know, we have some here at the appropriate level, and it lets them know this is a fun place to work. Actually, I found it's been a valuable question, because usually most people will say, oh, yeah, so-and-so did this to me, and I got back to him a couple weeks later, I did this. And I'm thinking, I want you on my team. I've had a couple people say, well, I was so mad at that person, I couldn't see them for two weeks, and it was just, and I'm like, whoa, OK, I'm finding this question isn't a bad one to weed out someone I don't want on my team at the same time, but that's sort of what we did there. I talked to them about before we can put somebody into rape, robberies, and murders, like this one gal is, that she's now prosecuting rape, robberies, and murders and doing maybe a trial a year, do we have a responsibility to give them a certain competency? Do we have a certain responsibility to make sure they're confident going in there? And what are those core competencies we're looking for? So it made me and my manager sit down and go through core competencies we expected when you get out of county court. So today, when you go through my county courts, and then how do we get there? That's the next level. 
Today, to go through my county courts, you are not eligible to go into district court until you've done at least 15 jury trials, because that's one way to get those core competencies in. At the end of that, we're going to say, do you have those? But we're going to require at least that before you get through it. We make you do at least one appeal of a judge. Sometimes it's just reading your own appellate record of, did I really set a record or not, and learning what you were saying. But second, it keeps my judges in check, quite frankly. Certain judges are easier to appeal than others. Uh, third, I make them ride along with the cops 20 hours before they can uh, get in there. I want them to learn the community, know the people they're working with. Now, ride along to me can be going to an autopsy. Can be going out with fishing game, which can be fun, or we'll have a massive thing where they go out with the DUI cops one night. They'll all go out together. Um, that's one way that we've built in the core competencies. I teach my people certain things that I saw sort of the life lessons. Life lesson for me: when you go in those first few months, if you don't make some contacts to help you through it, you're going to fail. So what have I set up in mind? My county attorneys all go over to the court together in the morning. They're not allowed to leave the court until they're all done. When you finish in your courtroom, you go next door. Can I help out? How can I help? If they say, I got it, go home, then you can go home. But if you don't, you're going to jump in there and help them. Because if you don't work as a team, if you don't put your teams together when you become in a, in a command position, your people are going to fail, uh, particularly when they're first getting out there. Uh, and that's what I found through my experience. I didn't start winning my trials until I, until I became part of a team. Actually, my, my people now, sometimes they'll have a dinner they do once a week. Some of the groups, as they come through, they sort of have their own classes. They've become friends for years now from our county court experience. The, uh, let's see, I'm going to be going in about 10 minutes, huh? so I better wrap up here pretty quick. Let me, um, um, I won't talk about it necessarily. One of the things I do, I, I'm looking for is people who are innovators. And part of it is I make my attorneys, my management attorneys, I just sent a group out to San Diego. I want them to study new things. I want them to come back with new ideas. Uh, my office had the first uh, veterans court in the state of Colorado, in an innovative idea. When I came into office, actually we had people coming back that first year from Afghanistan and Iraq. Military people were doing things we'd never seen before. Certainly my community knows the sacrifices, the freedom isn't free, the sacrifices those soldiers were making, and quite frankly, their families were making. So we opened the first Veterans Court. Mine in Colorado. There were other Veterans Court. Mine was the first one, I believe, that allowed felons. And in fact, our first court was all felons. Uh, when I look at Buffalo, which is the first Veterans Court, you have felonies, misdemeanors, and then petty offenses. Buffalo was all petty offenses, is where they were aimed at. They just studied 10 Veterans Courts across the country. And sure enough, their <coughs> study came out with the results in December. Mine's the riskiest court in the entire country. I have more felons than anybody. The, uh, at the same time, when they look at recidivism, which is when they finish your program or during your program, are they doing new crimes? I have the lowest recidivism rate in the entire country. And a lot of that is due to our volunteers. But that's a different way of looking at things. I mentioned I have a mediation unit. I have a juvenile diversion unit. I have two drug courts. I have a, a DUI court. Uh, we do more innovative things through our office than anybody else. And part of that is our people going out. Currently, I've got a group of attorneys who are very interested in human trafficking. We're now trying to rescue people out of human trafficking. Well, who are you rescuing in the typical human trafficking? It's people who have been forced into prostitution. Particularly when they've been doing that for some time, it's very difficult. We're trying to figure out how I can get a hook on them to make them go into some programs we're developing, yet I'm trying not to have to convict them or label them with prostitution at age 16, 17, 18, 19 that'll be on the record for the rest of their life. That's something we're trying to put together right now. And another group of attorneys who were interested in doing something about prescription fraud. So I now have a diversion team that we've hooked up with the police that's kicking off uh, actually this month where we are not charging them initially, but we're making them go into a diversion program trying to get off the prescription drugs, which can lead to thieving and some other things just because they're hooked on some prescription drug they were given. But that's sort of the innovation side of what we try to do. And with that, I've got just a couple minutes left, so I, I know I have to leave it open for questions. So do we have any questions? And I'll start with the cadets in particular. Do you have any questions? Because I've been told to do that. And then we'll come up to you. But you're not a cadet yet, right? <laughs> well, it sounds like, in general, uh, you're not in favor of uh, plea bargains. How, how do you decide if it's case-by-case -case basis? It sounds like, um, like I, I will say, uh, you know, in terms of my production, uh, two years ago, we hit over 200 felony trials. I think I'm the first DA's office ever to hit that. This year, we had about 185 felony trials. A Rappo that's closest to me, they didn't have 100 felony trials. 
Our production is way above anybody else, even though I have a disproportionate <coughs> amount of people in prison, and yet my people are focusing on the right cases. Like this year, over 100 of our trials were violent offenses or against kids or habitual criminals. My community expects law and order. At the same time, I have more diversion programs than anybody else. Nationwide, 97% of all cases are plea bargained by DAs. I may be at 96% even though I'm doing all those trials. And that's quite frankly because on a burglary, I can get anywhere from zero to 24 years in prison. If it's your neighbor kid who walked in through your front door that was unlocked and took your change jar that you throw your quarters in, you probably don't want that person to go to prison. <coughs> At the same time, if I got a home invasion where they've kicked off in your door and they've got automatic weapons and they're home invading, my deputy ought to be looking at the other end, but most of them are in between, and that's why in most cases plea bargain. So yes, I'm not, I can't tell you I'm against plea bargaining, but if I haven't got the attorneys who can do that 4% of the cases and willing to take a stand, they're not going to get the right bargain on the other 90%. Does that make sense? Does that sort of answer your question? We actually, yes? I actually don't understand what you're talking about when you're talking about veteran courts. What is a veteran court? What we do is uh, we actually, when we, it came in, we didn't even know how many veterans we had in the system. So it was actually a community effort. I was part of that. Public defender joined in, judges, a lot of community groups. They studied it for about a year. One of the things we noticed, we didn't know who was there, so we got the jail to actually put in their computer program. It's amazing what it takes to just get a spot on the computer to ask, are you a veteran? Are you active duty? Are you getting VA benefits? Uh, from that, actually, the jail's now developed. One of their wings is only veterans. <laughs> and then the veteran people know to go in there and say, can you help you? In our veterans court, we're looking, you have to have, have been active duty, you have to have been in a war zone, you have to have something that we can work on. At first it was PTSD, but it could be depression, but it's something that we can actually aid you on. We're then trying to get you the resources. Uh, we're giving, we're, 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 they're putting on them on probation or deferred sentences, and we're trying to give them a second chance. It's actually a tougher program than if they got regular probation. They're going to work a lot harder. But if they commit to it, they come out a better person. I come out with a safer community. If they won't commit to it, then uh, we're going to prosecute them like we did everybody else. So it's trying to give them a second chance. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. And then we'll hit you here. Go ahead. Um, then so I'll come back. With your veterans court, what do you think are some of the primary uh, concepts or approaches that make it such a success? I'll tell you, part of it's being in this community. Now, this is a heavy military community. Uh, one of the ways I'm able to get by on my budget is I have a fabulous volunteer program, and I've got a gal who coordinates our volunteers. I have a lot of people who are willing in this community to volunteer for our veterans court, be mentors, be in the court, try to help those soldiers through the, the process. So I think one of the things I have is people who are committed to the success of these people, uh, the people who are going through a tough time in their life in helping them work through. And actually, we have an aftercare program, if you will, that a lot of people are even committed to, after they're off of our probation, to still be with them, because they're going to have some bumps in the road uh, with that. So I think that's one of the big reasons, is that I have a community effort here. We have a lot of people on board. Um, I am the, my office is the gatekeeper. We decide who goes in there. But we're willing to take some risks with people, uh, because it's the right thing. And I got to tell you, there's some, like, I initially I got some heat because I wouldn't take somebody who did an attempted murder. I got to tell you, at some point, you get to a level that you say, this is too spectacular for a veteran's court. Uh, but we take more risks than others. And we've got people committed to it. Uh, yes, sir, you had, uh, I'll what come back to you. you want to stay in the public sector once you get out of the private sector? Oh, I have the greatest job ever. I, I started with that. I really do have a passion for this job. It is nice to come in to do the right thing. It's nice to work with people who have that same mission that want every day to do the right thing, want to learn to be better people. It's a fun environment to be in. So that's why I went public or private to public. I was looking for a job. Uh, I found I used to interview people saying, do you want to be a career prosecutor? Because I like to have career prosecutors. I found that's like asking a freshman, what's your major? <laughs> if you were like me, I changed three times. Uh, I got in that job. And I thought I'd be there three to five years, which a lot of my attorneys are, and then they go out into private practice. Uh, I just loved it. I've stayed. Uh, so I got hooked. I didn't think I'd be a career prosecutor. Ferguson brought um, grand juries to life. What is the role of the grand jury, and when uh, do you go to one versus uh, just deciding to prosecute? It? Okay, so. I'll give you a, a little warrant to anybody who can answer this question. Can anybody tell me what happened 800 years ago this year? <coughs> well, do, do your math first of all. Who said it first? I think a bunch of us said it. Well, I got, okay, I got up to three pins, if you like a D8 pin. 
There you go. Magna Carta was actually, uh, they were taking King John to task, the uh, knights were. One of the things they put in the Magna Carta was the grand jury. And it was a citizen, or it was actually a group of nobles that whatever King John did, they go to him, them to make sure that they weren't violating the people's rights. When our Constitution was written, it was based on that same idea of the grand jury. It's a citizen body. The, uh, the Ferguson actually, are, are the, um, the founders of the Constitution believed more in the people than they did the government officials. So actually under the Constitution, federal Constitution, every criminal case has to go in front of citizens at a grand jury to decide if criminal cases should be brought or not. They felt that was the greatest protection for people if they were wrongly charged and yet at the same time would have the review of people that should be charged. In Colorado, actually, I can just file charges. Most, uh, you don't have to go through the grand jury. I, I, I'm a strong believer in citizens. I'm a strong believer in having a grand jury, so I have one. Uh, they, when you bring it to them, they actually are the, it, it, it is their grand jury. My prosecutor actually works for them, and they tell them that. So do the cops. So as they're evaluating the case, they turn to the cop and say, re-interview this person, subpoena this person to come in front of us. I want this DNA done. I want these uh, cell phone records looked at. And uh, as a, our grand jury left uh, in January, and I, we selected a new group that will sit there for the entire year in January. It's the last group left because grand jury's been out there. I said, what would you want the community to know about what you're doing? They said, number one, we want them to know we really are trying to get at the right answer the best we can. And we're working the hardest we can. And that's why we make cops sometimes do stuff over and over. Second, they actually liked being with 12 people. That sometimes my view of the evidence, when we go back and talk, it's nice to be able to talk with others and say, hey, there's a different way of looking at this. Let's go down this avenue instead of some others we were thinking about. I think the grand jury system is actually a very good one, and it's set up there as a backup. I thought it was interesting in Ferguson, they were asking the US people to look at it. They have to go to grand jury. Uh, they, have, they don't have a choice, so it had to go through a grand jury uh, when they, and if you notice just recently on the Florida case, what's the Florida one? They just announced the U.S. Justice Department that they weren't going to uh, bring charges on Trayvon Martin. I don't know if they took it to a grand jury or not, and they just didn't want to uh, uh, charge that, or whether they just decided we're not even going to take it to the grand jury. Does that sort of answer your grand jury question? Uh, what was your specific question? We may have to, uh, yeah. we'll have to answer it afterwards at this point, but I'll sit and talk with you about it. Okay. Or any, any other questions people have? I think that's, is that it? Is that our time? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, that's pretty cool. See, I made out better than you guys with the cups and the pins. <laughs>